Hello, everybody. I'm coming to you from the animal shelter, as always. Uh, we spent all day yesterday transforming this into a, a, a tighter-looking um, production suite for the podcast and other videos. Um, we have three cameras in here now instead of two. We got some lights. We're going we're gonna to black out this window here so you don't catch the glare. We're going to block out that window there. And we got the sound on point, and I'm really excited for the uh, live stream we're doing next Friday, or actually this Friday, January 22nd at 7 p.m. Pacific and 10 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be talking about uh, you know music licensing and how to make money with your music and songwriting and just anything you know anything that uh, you guys want to uh, want to talk about. Please subscribe to the channel. You might be uh, watching this over uh, Facebook or Twitter or something um, that one of your Facebook friends posted or shared on their profile. Please subscribe to the channel so you'll see the videos um, as soon as I make them. So today I wanted to give a brief a brief video on how to boost your performance royalties by 50% at least. And when I say at least, a little caveat, it also entails getting people to write tracks for you, which you take um, a piece of. So it's, it's at least 50%. So on tracks that you write all of, 100% of, boosting your performance by 50%. And then if it's a track somebody um, wrote that you didn't have anything to do with the writing on, you could still get um, half of the publisher share of performance royalties from that. So here it is. Okay, so... What you want to do is plan on pursuing a co-pub arrangement with a library. Now, this is only for 0.1% of people doing music for reality shows, you know, music licensing cues and stuff. And the, the only reason I say it's only applicable to 0.1% of y'all is that it's time-consuming and you need to dedicate yourself to it. So naturally... The library takes the publisher's share of the performance royalties, which is 50% of the total, and the writers take the writer's share of performance royalties, which is which is 50% of the of the grand total. Okay? So you have the publisher's share and the writer's share. 50-50. So what you want to do is try to get not only your 100% writer's share, but also get 50% of the publisher's share. That brings your revenue up 50%. No, it brings it up, yeah, 50%, but it brings the library's revenue down by 50%. Okay? So instead of making $100 on your writers and the library makes $100 on their publishers, you'll get $150, but they'll only get $50. So you have to make it worth their while and their time and their money to give you this deal. Because if it brings... The library's revenue down by 50%. It's going to bring their profit down, you know, 70 to 90%. Okay? So you need to make it really worth their while to do this. And I'm going to tell you how. If you're a writer and you're submitting 10 to 20 cues a month to these libraries, you can't get a co-pub arrangement. Or it's nearly impossible. Okay? A couple libraries out there that'll do it, but the bar is set so high that I don't even know if you could do 20 cues that good in a month. I mean, they're, they're just set really high. So what you want to do is you want to boost your output to 100 to 200 cues a month. Okay? How do you do that? Number one, you write more. Maybe instead of doing 20 cues, you do 30. Okay? Then you find some friends of yours that you went to school with, that you know from the music community, you know, friends and colleagues, acquaintances, and you start having them do cues as well. Okay, so you're a ring Now you're a mini library. The only thing you're missing is the sales department, which is the hardest, okay? I don't care what you say. I, I, I could find a dozen composers in three hours that'll work for me, and I'm just... I'm a, you know, I only have 1,300 tracks in my library. It's not like I'm a big money library. They could probably find 300 composers in 10 minutes, okay, literally. But this, So the sales, getting your sales game on point is a lot harder. So you're missing the sales, but you have a lot of cues. So that's when you approach a library and say, hey, instead of 
the library taking a hundred percent of the publisher share, you ask them to give up half of their publisher share to you for you to take off the top for your troubles. So you get 50% of the publisher share plus anything that you've written. So say, you know, 30 cues you wrote a hundred percent of, well, you, you would get a hundred percent of the writer's share and 50% of the publisher share on top. Plus all the other cues that you're a and executive producing from people up under you, you know, you get half of that publisher's share as well. Okay. In addition to a and and executive producing those cues, you also need to do the metadata, which, I mean, my job is dope. If I had to pick a worse, the worst part of it, which is still better than any day gig, um, as people say, it's the metadata. Okay. Now, metadata comes in a spread. You know, in iTunes, when you click uh, more info and it has all those little slots like composer, album artist, album artist, comments, all that stuff, that's metadata. But for libraries, it's a spreadsheet and it says song title, file name, writer one, writer two, publisher one, publisher two, genre, mood, style of, um, sub genre, male vocal, female vocal, song, cue. Yeah, it's it's time consuming. Okay, because each cue might have a different set of writers. Description, you have to write a sentence on how the cue sounds. Okay, so every cue, if there's 200 cues a month, you have to listen to a cue, 200, 200 different cues, and say, okay, this is a great jazz-infused EDM cue with polka vocals or something. Okay, and not only is it time-consuming, it's also very, 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 very important because if your metadata is tagged incorrectly, then no one's going to find your cue when they're searching for it. And also... You might not even be able to get paid for that cue if the metadata is wrong. If if a certain cue has different writers than like different writers listed in the metadata than the people who actually wrote the song, well, the wrong people are gonna get paid. Okay? So metadata is super important. So that fifty percent of the performance royalties, it's not a freebie. You gotta earn that. You know, you you really you really gotta earn it. And uh, you know, for the first five years I I've been in LA um, 2006 to 2011, no one asked me to do a co-pub deal with them. I mean, no, no composers came to me asking for a co-pub deal, but from 2011 to now, I've gotten nine that I could remember vividly, nine inquiries. You know, it's always from someone that I've made a little bit of money for their, their music is great. And then they say, Hey, let's do a co-pub deal. And I say, great, here's what I need. But a boop, 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 boop. And then you never, they, they don't want to do it. They don't have time. Because to have a co-pub to deal with a library, it's, it's almost a full-time job. It's definitely a part-time job. Definitely a part-time job that you don't get a paycheck for for at least a year when the performance royalties start coming in. And even if there is upfront sync money, that takes a long time to come in anyway. So it's a part-time job that it's a lot of work, time-consuming, that you don't get paid for, if not a full-time job, you know, if you're doing it right, it, it should be a full-time job. Like if, a, if, a, if I'm approaching a big money library for a co-pub situation, a distribution deal with, hopefully I'll have more info on that later in the year. Um, it's, it's basically a full-time job, but I'm conditioned in the sense, cause I do music licensing full-time anyway, where it, it just fits in to what I'm doing, okay? But if, if, if you're a part-time wanting to go full-time and you have a day job or you're in school doing metadata for 200 tracks a month, I mean, that, that's heavy, but it's worth it in the end, okay? Because in addition to your writer's share, you're getting publisher share, especially if you could find people that write what you don't write. If you do EDM and you find a couple guys that do indie rock, then that's good. Because then you you wouldn't you, you you don't make that kind of music professionally. You won't be able to eat off those cues if you didn't do a co-pub deal. Now you can. So those are just some pointers to think about before approaching someone for a co-pub deal. A lot of smaller libraries are more apt to give a co-pub deal because they don't have as many cues. Okay, than a big library with hundreds of thousands of cues, and you could bring them two hundred a month. That doesn't mean anything. 
But if someone has only a couple a uh, couple thousand cues in their library, then they're more apt to give a co-pub deal. Okay? So hope that was um, insightful. Again, January 22nd, 7 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific live stream, live chat on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe. February 24th, 2016, Hollywood, California. I am giving the biggest reality non-scripted based TV music panel in history. And look, this is videotaping. So you can't I can't backtrack on those words. This is going to be the biggest, okay? I got the when y'all hear the soups that I have, which will be released, which I'm going to tell everybody about on Friday during the live stream. If you're not in LA, you're going to want to fly in for this cuz this is huge. Huge, huge, huge. Okay? So again, this is John Fulford from Music Licensing Lifestyle. Thank you for watching. Uh, subscribe. Talk to me in the comments. Utilize the comments section. Type at me in the comments. I read them. I respond to everybody. My email is musiclicensingpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you again for watching and have a good rest of your weekend.